Good evening and a warm welcome to Weekend Dialogue on Biz Roundup. Tonight in our studios, we've invited the Secretary General of the International Federation of Red Cross and Red Crescent Societies, Mr. Elhaj Asi. Good evening and a very warm welcome to Sri Lanka and to our studios. Thank you very much. Good evening and good for having me. Certainly, it's indeed our pleasure. Um, you're here for a very short visit and uh, we are indeed honoured to have you here. Let me ask you what uh, your visit is all about in Sri Lanka during these couple of days. So we are very pleased to be here to uh, visit our national society, mm -hmm. namely the Sri Lankan Red Cross. Right. We are the International Federation composed of 190 national societies, among them the Sri Lankan Red Cross. And it is important for me you know, to go and visit those countries, not only in the heat of a disaster or in the middle of conflict, but also to go and then see how can we take stock of past experiences. You know, in Sri Lanka, we had a tsunami. You know, we had a conflict where the National Society also got involved. What are the gains that are being made? But also, what is the last lap you know, to walk and to reach you know, those who are hardest to reach and most vulnerable in the pursuit of our humanitarian mandate and mission in this country? Mm -hmm. So it's been uh, quite fruitful. And um, so we are still uh, continuing having those discussions and meeting also with officials of the country, right. you know, so that we continue to accompany the effort of populations and communities in responding to their needs. Uh, if I may also ask you about the outcome of this visit, I understand that you've met, uh, you've travelled to Jaffna and Kilinochi during uh, the three-day period of your visit and also met with the President of Sri Lanka. Uh, what's the response and what have you really witnessed? Uh, again, you're visiting Sri Lanka um, close to about 10 years apart from your first visit. We'd like to know your, your views. No, indeed. I uh, had an opportunity to visit Sri Lanka about 10 years ago mm -hmm. as a staff member of the United Nations. Well, I was very pleased to be able to go to Jaffna, which I could not access then. Right. But also to be here with the Red Cross, you know, that has been working with the communities there, helping them recover something which is extremely important to them, which simply put is their human dignity. Mm -hmm. And that takes different forms. A housing program that is uh, very large, over 50,000 houses built and being accompanied by the Red Cross. We could meet you know, those people. Well, as I said, I was going to be taken to so-called beneficiaries mm -hmm. or victims of conflict, of tsunami. What I saw was simply proud people that were recovering their dignity coming to a house, you know, where they could elevate their children and raise them in a dignified manner, have a place of worship in their own place, and communicating a sense of hope, you know, for the future. Right. At the same time, there were people supported with livelihood programs, with start up very modestly, and were able to build, you know, their big business, regaining their livelihoods, sending their school children back to school. And this is really good achievements that we've made. Is it enough? Maybe not. We need to go to scale. We need to reach more and then reach further. And that is uh, what we are here to do and explore together with the Sri Lankan Red Cross. Right. In that, uh, in that context, uh, there's, despite many organizations coming in to fund uh, the northern resettlement uh, process and projects uh, they are in the north, uh, together with the Red Cross, I think there's also a dearth of about 60,000 houses to support the people so that they can engage in their normal livelihoods. How does the Red Cross see this and want to play an active role going forward? The Red Cross, uh, uh, unlike many other organizations, is here all the time. Mm -hmm. They've been here before any shock, during, and then they remain after. And that is really a presence and a proximity which is extremely important that we need to build on. That's one. You know, second, they're present everywhere in the country. You know, 25 branches, you know, all over, and then having volunteers that are embedded in those communities, you know, where they work. That's about now identifying those needs of the hour and responding to them. Housing happened to be one of those needs. Right. And we have took a big chunk of it and have accompanied people to build over 50,000 houses, mm -hmm. which is an owner-driven, and also people not, not only passively receiving you know, that as a gift, but investing their own resources to even improve the quality of their houses, investing mm -hmm. their own labor, and then having a sense of ownership of what they are doing. And I think this is much more in line with our humanitarian mandate, which is to accompany people all the time mm -hmm. in responding to their needs of the hour like we did during the tsunami, 
like we do also on a daily basis, you know, with young people on the coastal lines, you know, for search and rescues and first aid, okay. and recruiting a lot of volunteers that can also be joining the same cause and responding to the needs of their communities. Uh, if we talk about the projects of the Red Cross here in Sri Lanka, there was a certain concern of um, concerning a particular incident. Um, before we talk about that, I'd like to know how the Red Cross um, manages to handle these projects in a transparent, humanitarian and uh, in, in a positive manner so that it impacts the livelihoods in, in the best and positive uh, manner. For the Red Cross, uh, what is important is not only what we do, mm -hmm. it is also extremely important how we do it. Whatever we do should be in line with our principles. And those fundamental principles of uh, humanitarian action are based on humanity to start with. And we need to do that you know, in respect of people, namely the beneficiaries, but also in an impartial, neutral way that is also fostering universality and unity. Right. And that is a how is extremely important. Now, and if we manage uh, programs, you manage in a transparent way, we have uh, checks and balances and control mechanisms that are monitoring and evaluating, including if we are aware of any bottlenecks along the way, we take it extremely seriously, no matter what it is, to go to the bottom of it, and then either it is validated, and then we take the sanctions which are required, or it is not validated, and then people have to be also restored in their right and dignity, and then we keep on moving with our programs. Right. Uh, the, the particular incident that I was talking about was uh, an officer uh, who was found last year to have allegedly um, requested a sexual bribe during the conduct of a project. Uh, although the Red Cross conducted an investigation, it was proved that there was no evidence. So how do you handle such uh, cases within uh, the IFRC and the Red Cross implementing uh, your projects in specifically the north uh, of the country? Yeah, first of all, by acting. Mm -hmm. uh, that uh, You cannot hear that and ignore. You then, the simple fact of conducting an investigation is that when you listen to the case, you take it very seriously, you go to the bottom of it. Mm -hmm. But you say it is an allegation. Allegation can be proven right or wrong. In this case, it was proven wrong. And then the person that was really put uh, on the spot, you know, could be also restored in his right. If it was not uh, the case, then, then the appropriate sanctions you know, would have been taken. But I think what is important here is to listen to any complaints of any kind and take actions you know, toward it and never ignore or then push you know, under the secret, under the carpet, you know, things that you uh, encounter on the way. It is only human enterprises. You know, Red Cross people also are human people that may make mistakes. And if those mistakes you know, are found, you know, then you take the appropriate action because it is important for us, but you also have to do it diligently to make sure that everybody's right is protected. And what we know about this particular case that you are referring is the outcome, you know, was not substantiated, but the due diligence was done, and that is the most important. Right. Uh, and Secretary General, if we move on to talk about uh, Red Cross and future projects in Sri Lanka, I think um, with the end of the conflict, uh, Sri Lanka has been upgraded as a middle-income country and there seems to be a dearth in uh, funding for projects. But as you also did mention earlier, the Red Cross has been in Sri Lanka throughout from the beginning and it's continuing to uh, ensure its presence in Sri Lanka. How do you see this relationship with the country going forward? You see, uh, as I said, we are present in 190 countries, including the richest country in this world, mm -hmm. next to the poorest country in this world. What we are seeing today in the world is a globalization of fragilities and vulnerabilities. It is quite interesting to see that the majority of people are no longer living in rural areas, but they are living in urban and peri-urban settings. That is a challenge because it brings you know, many problems related to infrastructure building and access to services. We're also seeing, unfortunately, that the majority of people in the world are not living in the poorest countries, but in middle-income, high-income countries. And that is now the approach from a humanitarian point of view is to look at risks and vulnerabilities wherever they are in terms of reducing gaps and disparities and responding to the needs of people. Now, coming back to here, you know, what it means is to, in every area, to understand 
where are those vulnerabilities and then try to support people in addressing them, building on their own resources and the strategies that they are developing. Mm -hmm. And that means also, you know, targeting the agents you know, of change and then for the future, namely the youth and then the young people for better access, you know, to services, better access to information, better protection, you know, for themselves and then supporting some of the efforts which are being made in this country has reached quite good efforts in terms of education, mm -hmm. you know, for example, and use that as a base you know, of building on. So livelihood is extremely important. We know that uh, more and more employment is becoming a big issue you know, for young people, and that can be leading into situations of risk and vulnerabilities that, if not mitigated, you know, can become the situation of risk. So through our volunteer programs and an investment you know, in communities, and vocational trainings that are being provided through the network of our federation, we can also explore how together with the Sri Lankan Red Cross we could work in those areas that will be building on the gains made out of the crisis mm -hmm. to take it to the next level for a sustainable human development point of view. Uh, as you talk about sustainable human development, uh, the government is focusing on reconciliation and communal harmony. How does the Red Cross see your future projects focusing on this? I think the reconciliation and harmony from a government point of view has many dimensions, I'm sure. One of it is a political dimension mm -hmm. and then in citizenship. That is what governments and their citizens do. And as part of the Red Cross is concerned, that is now how from a humanitarian point of view, you know, you can have a ripple effect, you know, or positive into that. Right. And there, so the niche is clearly defined. It could be a housing rehabilitation program, you know, so that people recover their dignity, you mm -hmm. know, through that and exercise, you know, their rights sort of uh, citizens. It could be to better access to health. Right. You know, we have health infrastructure through the Sri Lankan Red Cross throughout the country, then that is extremely important. Mm -hmm. It is also about you know, the voluntary services as well as the intervention in the social aspect in building livelihood. We believe that humanitarian action can be a contribution to social capital, mm -hmm. and social capital de facto can have a ripple effect and all the efforts that are bringing unity and harmony into s communities and countries. And that may be then complemented by the political process, which is, of course, you know, the prerogative of governments and mm -hmm. then those who invert, intervene in those areas. Right. Uh, if I may ask, ask you about uh, the funding aspect of uh, the Red Cross, how do you manage to raise funds and what is, what is the underlying foundation here? The underlying foundation of the Red Cross is the trust that we are building with people and communities. Mm -hmm. Over 150 years of interventions there are so many people who have benefited you know, from the services of the Red Cross, and they do remember. Those people give to mm -hmm. the Red Cross. We benefit from a lot of donation of individuals who also drive other individuals you know, to donate you know, to the Red Cross. And those resources then, then we distribute among national societies, particularly if they are facing shocks. Mm -hmm. Now, if the shock arrives, then, then we launch what we call appeals you know, to go to scale like in the case you know, of tsunami, for example. So you see the appeal multiplying and the resources go to really a you know, very large scale. The same approach, then we support at country level for mobilization of local resources and donation. But we are 190, some of us you know, members are extremely wealthy and they also provide us with resources that we can give to other national societies you know, in need. The trust cannot be defeated and that's why we are very 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 uh, regarding in terms of you know how resources are being managed mm -hmm. we also very regarding as far as results are concerned because at the end of the day the real benchmark that only matters it is what is being done through the eyes of the beneficiaries how do they appreciate what it is being done how it is changing their lives how it is changing their situations in the material support that we are giving to them mm -hmm. so in general I think we are quite happy with what is being achieved, but if we check that against the needs that we encounter across the world, mm -hmm. we still have a lot to do and we are ready also to step up to the plate to do more. Right. Talking about the global needs and uh, the increasing demand for, uh, for, for resources to be managed in cases of di uh, disasters because the frequency and um, you know, the scale of these disasters continue to rise and the magnitude seems to be bigger uh, every time. Um, 
talking about the management of your resources, how, are, how well are you geared to do this? You are spot on there. You know, we live in unprecedented time of scale and magnitude of shocks and disasters in the world. Mm -hmm. Be they natural hazards or be they uh, conflicts that are man-made. We have never seen so many people in need of humanitarian assistance since the Second World War. And this is really serious. We've never seen such a number of people on the move, 60 million people who left their houses seeking refuge you know, around the world. We've never seen that since the Second World War. Mm -hmm. We estimate you know, those needs in financial terms about 25 billion US dollar a year. That is huge. And that cannot be handled by the Red Cross alone, no doubt about it. Right. So we're taking our share you know, to it because we are present in every single country there. So we raise you know, money uh, to, on top of you know, what is needed. So together, as 100 and national, 190 national societies, the Federation and the International Committee, mm -hmm. we invest about 60 billion US dollars you know, in humanitarian and development programs you know, over the long term. These are huge figures, but the scale of human suffering and need are at a scale at the same time that requires you know, that we build more partnership, that we expand that base of partnership, we have better access to people you know, to do that, and hopefully the push factors, you know, namely the conflict, a better protection of the environment, a better early warning and early response can contribute to the fact that we have less people in need. Mm -hmm. Because unless we get less people in need, we will always try to play catch up and that is not what will be contributing to sustainable development. Right. Uh, finally, um, Secretary General, I think as you depart Sri Lanka, I'd like to ask you what you would uh, take back from uh, your meeting with the President and your visit uh, up north uh, to the country and how the discussion with the President went. Coming back uh, from the north, uh, I was sharing with my colleague that it is heartening to see dignity and hope also in humanitarian action, mm -hmm. that people uh, that uh, appreciate support that was provided to them and take their destiny in their own hands and then moving forward. Mm -hmm. You know, meaning like you know, I witnessed somebody introducing to me, you know, his son through the livelihood program that could be supported to go to school and entering medical school, you know, next year. This is human stories that are extremely important. Mm -hmm. It is not only counting the number of houses built, it's about appreciating what it means for people. And we think that there is some achievement there and then we can do more and we will commit to accompany the Sri Lankan Red Cross to do more. The engagement with the president we met on Thursday also to discuss the special role of our network and the National Society of Red Cross in Sri Lanka, mm -hmm. which is here all the time. They don't need to come in where is the shock or get out. Right. They stay and have this auxiliary role to the public services in supporting the efforts in improving the quality of life of people. Mm -hmm. And we found also a very positive echo. So in that regard and staying true to our principles of humanity, impartiality and independence, we will continue to put the services of our network to the profit of the Sri Lankan Red Cross and to the benefit of the people in support to the government and all the other actors' efforts in that regard. Right. Thank you very much uh, for your time here, Secretary General. It was indeed a pleasure to have you here in our studios. Thank you very much for having me. We had with us uh, the Secretary General of the uh, International Federation of Red Cross and Red Crescent Societies, Mr. Elhaj Asi, joining us during his visit in Sri Lanka. Do join us after this break on Biz Roundup. <laughs>